we have brought with us someone who has written a ballad about the adventures of Frodo, the minstrel of Gondor. Yeah. Frodo of the Nine Fingers and the Ring of Doom. <laughs> Welcome to Buy the Bywater, a podcast on the Megaphonic Network. I'm Ned Raggett. I'm Oriana Schwent. I'm Jared Pekachak. And we're here to talk about all things J.R.R. Tolkien. His work, his inspirations and impact, creative interpretations in other media, languages, lore, ripoffs, parodies, anything we think is interesting. Thanks for joining us. Hello and welcome to the 49th episode of By the Bywater. It is great to be back with you a little quicker than normal this time because we're trying to get ourselves back on the recording schedule sync of things where we do things once a month at the start of the month rather than more the middle. And uh, boy, do we have news um, as announced <laughs> on social media as we had uh, already previously talked about, but we've got more thorough news here about the live megaphonic network podcast recording event I've now officially called, uh, for lack of a better term, but it's perfectly accurate. Accurate, two conversations in a game show, an easy <laughs> megaphonic podcast. That'll be the three of us here by the Bywater, along with uh, the good folks of It's Just a Show, the MST3K podcast that started the whole affair, that is currently co-hosted by Charlotte Wells and Chris Puma, who founded the whole thing, along with Game Show 1939, where your expertise is based on what you know about stuff in 1939. <laughs> that will be done by Chris Puma again, along with Mikey Collins. This is all happening Saturday. April 22nd in a month's time, more or less, a little under a month's time as we record this. This will be at Passages Bookshop at 1801 Northwest Upshur Suite 660 in Portland, Oregon. Free to attend, and it's beginning at 5 p.m. Now, that's a lot of information you want it in one place. That's easy enough. Go to megaphonic.fm slash live dash 2023. That's all you need. All the information is there. Links are there. And it is happening. And it's all happening because Oriana moved to Portland. That's really what it came down to. <laughs> What's so funny about this is we're, we're going to be moving back to New York. We've decided to move back to New York like this fall. So this is like oh. very special, very one time only, I guess, in the Pacific Northwest. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll do another one of these live shows, you know, somewhere on the West Coast in the future. But uh, yeah, this Portland engagement is very 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 special one time only i'm so excited and in, as kind of a special like not everyone can come see us live and while you'll be able to listen to the episode for sure i believe as a bonus for our patrons um we will have some video i believe perhaps mm -hmm. if you've got some extra money in the next couple of months plop it over on our patreon you can be part of the discord and see this live show hopefully hopefully yes and that uh that or at is least the patreon. parts of it yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what we choose to put up yes <laughs> so uh <laughs> this will be uh this will be uh the patreon for the entire megaphonic network it's not just us and so you get a whole wide range of things and please join us we get more people joining all the time we have some people who've joined us specifically because they're by the bywater fans we absolutely love it thank you very much and uh, we'd love to see more of you there it's it's expensive it's nice it's great but uh boy you dropped some news on here we didn't realize you're heading back to the east coast boy, I know, you... we like just decided but, uh, but yeah it's it's you know, it's time. It's time to head back east. But, uh, you know, Portland is lovely. It's a lovely town. So if you are in town or nearby within driving distance, you know, uh, it, it'll be a really fun time. Yeah. Well, well, think of think of what you've been doing as Portland as your sort of like rebound experience from the time in L.A. And then it you was, can properly yes, move on to the next thing. It's like our healing, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, it's like yeah. when when people used to go to like the take the waters <laughs> back in the day. I, I love it. Well, we're going to have to get used to the fact when we record or resume here that uh, at some point or uh, turned to thing we were recording, uh, the, the skies will be noticeably darker outside yeah. the windows <laughs> and all that, like we used to do for the first couple of years, and then things change. So, oh, well, we'll, we'll make do. So anyway, that is the uh, basic All of Us news. We'll do a quick mention of it again at the end here uh, with the URL. And we do hope to see you there, our 50th episode. And uh, boy, that'll 
be something. But we need to move on to, well, the main topic that has had my co-host tearing their hair out for the last <laughs> yeah. uh, couple of weeks. We don't have to. Oh, <laughs> um, yes, we do. <laughs> but we do have some actual news news uh, in general to talk about. So, Jared, as always, do please take it away. After a welter of news last time, the past few weeks have been a little quieter, though there is this. A last batch of cast announcement has been made for the second season of The Rings of Power, as has been the case since the original cast was named. No word on what characters any of these newer editions are doing, but two veteran performers have been named, Irish actor Kieran Hines and English actor Rory Kinnear, along with another younger British performer, Tanya Moody, known primarily for stage roles and some TV appearances in her home country. We, of course, wish them the best of luck in whatever the second second season turns out to be <laughs> hopefully they won't have to talk about tattoos as maps or, or uh, 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 breaking my brain every time i think about that uh, <laughs> god uh, in the meantime a discovery of some letters by tolkien has recently been announced by the uk's national archives these are to do with research support for language research at oxford soon after the end of world war ii in europe and are more of historical interest than anything to do with middle earth beyond the linguistic field in general but as one commentator said it's kind of nice to see his handwriting again and especially since, given this was a formal letter, it's a lot more neatly presented than some of the manuscript scrawls one can find. And boy, can you find them. I mean, they've been reproduced yeah. every so often. You know, Christopher Tolkien deserved all the all the praise and attention he got just for deciphering some of that yeah. stuff. So we yeah. Get I was like reading that the there's that news article that has, you know, the thing that has the image of the letter in it. And I was like, oh, my God, I can read it all. <laughs> <laughs> it's so comprehensible. <laughs> clear straightforward it's sort of yeah. like he, he knew he had to given the context of it yeah. <laughs> so like you know that's clear. i fully i fully get this it's sort of like okay i will pay attention to this but you're just like ah <laughs> it's there. not on the back of her seat or whatever yeah well but, uh, but anyway that cast announcement it's one of those cases where i'm like okay these are some quality actors here and i i have a feeling they're desperately trying to like you know p- please add some gloss to what yeah. our disaster that we've cooked love akira nines Love a Kieran Hines. Truly. As much as I like Kieran Hines, like go watch the terror yes. immediately and yes. everything else that he does. Uh, Rory Kinnear, so great. I'm sure Tanya Moody is like incredible performer, but I also don't think gloss when I hear Kieran Hines. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, maybe that's not the word. <laughs> Patina, if you will. Yeah, yeah. But, it, you know, good good for them. I hope they're getting paid really well. And I hope they have fun, you know, doing yeah. whatever it is that they're doing. <laughs> good for you role. guys. <laughs> Something invented, more invented characters, some nonsense. It would be Who knows? really funny if Karen Hines played like an elf. I really, I mean, kidding aside, is, I really is he do Kierden? hope. Like, <laughs> I really do hope Kieran Hines plays like proto Saruman the way that we have like this proto Gandalf running around. I think he'd be a great Saruman. Oh hell yeah! Um, right. yeah but also, that, yeah. yes, Kieran <laughs> would be very funny. <laughs> <laughs> A delicate elf. It could, it could be. You never <laughs> <Yeah>. know. <laughs> Very unlikely. No, this this summer reminds me of one of my favorite performances by him. He's not really that much in the final cut of the movie. You almost have to pay attention to these there. He's clearly in the cast. But in There Will Be Blood, he plays uh, Daniel oh, day right. is like, you know, yeah. Yeah. side yeah. guy. Yeah. And I think one of my favorite moments in that film, which I absolutely love, I mean, you know, he served, served that Oscar and then some, is uh, is the bit where the uh, one other guy, I forget who he is, uh, not not one of the major actors, one of the roles, says something sort of casual about Daniel Day-Lewis, how he's raising his kid, and that causes that explosion mm-hmm. where Daniel Day-Lewis basically just, just destroys him over five minutes, just in a single camera shot, and Hines is there sitting next to Lewis, and things. he doesn't say a word, <laughs> but it's just the look on his face, he kind of knows what's going on, and sort of like, yeah, you don't want to be on the other <laughs> side of that table. <laughs> it's, it's such a good combination of actors, and only one's talking, but they're both there. Mm-hmm. It's truly, truly marvelous. So, Hi there, Ned here doing the editing, and I realized I made a mistake right now, so I wanted to clean it up and do this little drop-in to explain what's going on, is that, uh, of course, Kieran Hines is, of course, in There Will Be Blood. However, I confused the scene I was thinking of with another scene. Both scenes are great, however. The one I'm describing is more towards the end of the movie, and Kevin J. O'Connor's character is the one who's sitting with Daniel Plainview as he is confronting the guy from Standard Oil who presumed to speak about how to raise his kid, inadvertently, if you will, but an amazing scene that is. The one with Heinz I'm thinking about is uh, near the start of the movie where it's uh, 
Daniel Day Lewis and him, and they are talking with Paul Dano as one of his characters, because of course, remember, he plays two characters in that movie, has come to let Plainview know about where some oil can be found. Both amazing scenes, and while Haynes does eventually speak in the scene later on, it's that first two minutes where he's just sitting there and smoking and watching. Marvelous stuff. Anyway, check that out in the show notes. Thanks very much, and now back to the show. No one, no one told me how funny that movie was. I only saw it like oh. pretty recently, mm-hmm. and you know, forever I thought that it was this kind of really dramatic and serious, and like you know, it is fairly dramatic, but it was so funny. It was I yeah. laughed so much, which sounds <laughs> weird, but but it, it was just really funny, and that's the, you know, that's Paul Thomas Anderson. <laughs> yeah, the melodrama lends itself to it. I caught it on the original theatrical run. I'm very grateful for that to this day. So uh, that was that was experience. We could go on, but uh, we're shifting from we're shifting gears in quality here. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> heavily. It's so, so easy not to talk about this. <laughs> hey, I brought it up. We got to go through it. And this way, we can say we've done it. <laughs> this way, we can say yes, we've done it. Yes, and then we can move on to the never let us speak of it again phase because that's what we'll have to do here for ourselves. Sanity's sick. So anyway, the choice of topic was mine. I brought this upon ourselves. <laughs> Even I was surprising myself and sort of like, did I make a mistake? But nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> and so I will begin. As we said in our episode about it two years ago, the Rankin-Bass adaptation of The Hobbit, while not an unalloyed success by any means, was still a remarkably concise version of the main story, able to touch on the generally lighter tone of the source material, as well as deeper themes in the creator's own fashion. It did famously receive a Peabody Award and various other nominations, as well as being a rating success that the network repeated as a full broadcast a couple of years later. Recently, it's been made available on streaming on HBO Max in its original aspect ratio, an improvement over the versions on other services which were stretched to fill widescreen frames. And while the world of what is or isn't available in general on streaming has never been more unsettled, especially at Warner Brothers in particular, Mm. it's kind of nice to know it's there. Rankin Bass's follow-up to that adaptation, their 1980 version of The Return of the King, is not on HBO Max, and let's hope it stays that way. (laughs) (laughs) It's a little hard to say that of the various adaptations or reworkings of Tolkien's work across all kinds of media, that there's one absolute worst version out there. In terms of the rocks in your head feeling upon finishing it, the American radio adaptation of The Lord of the Rings is my own choice for worst, but the 12-hour commitment necessary for it, combined with it being overshadowed by the farce superior BBC radio adaptation a couple of years later, has helped it to simply fall into more of a deserved obscurity over the decades. In contrast, Rankin Bass's Return to the King is akin to something like, say, the Star Wars holiday special, something heavily <laughs> publicized and anticipated following an initial success that turned out to be far more of a disaster than anything else. But at least that holiday special retains a weird fascination all this time, as can be seen in the upcoming documentary on it, A Disturbance in the Force. The likelihood of something equivalent for this Return of the King is pretty low. It should be noted out of the gate that Rankin-Bass had long been planning some sort of follow-up to their Hobbit adaptation. The John Colhane New York Times piece from late 1977, around the time The Hobbit originally aired, where he interviewed both Rankin and Ralph Bakshi about their forthcoming adaptations, included this quote from Rankin himself. If The Hobbit is a success on television, we will release it to the theaters. Then we will go on to complete our next Tolkien work, which will continue the characters we have established in The Hobbit, and will be adapted from The Hobbit and the last book in the Ring trilogy, The Return of the King. At this point, we are scripted, the music is composed and recorded, our backgrounds are painted, the soundtrack is partially completed, and new characters are designed, such as Frodo Baggins. End quote. Now, no theatrical release of the Rankin-Bass production did result, at least in the U.S., but otherwise things pretty much did progress from there exactly as Rankin described it over the next couple of years. Unsurprisingly, the core creative team on that production remained essentially unchanged throughout the, from that which worked on The Hobbit. Besides the duo of Rankin and Jules Bass itself, Romeo Miller wrote the screenplay and Maury Laws handled the music. Lester Abrams, having created the original character designs for The Hobbit based on separate early work noticed by Rankin, returned once more in that role, while Rankin Bass's Japanese animation partner's top craft, under the overall supervision of Toru Hara, similarly continued their general work throughout, with no sense that Bakshi's eventual 1978 Lord of the Rings film had caused them to rethink or redo anything on that front. 
On the casting front, there are a couple of returning performers in key roles. John Huston as Gandalf, Theodore, a.k.a. Brother Theodore, as Gollum, and in a striking enough dual performance, Orson Bean played both the older Bilbo as well as Frodo. Regulars from the general Rankin-Bass voice actor team such as Don Messick and Paul Fries, as well as deep voice singer Thurl Ravenscroft, also came back, while Glenn Yarborough, who had provided lead vocals on two key songs used throughout the Hobbit adaptation, here was directly cast as, quote, the minstrel of Gondor, unquote, and we'll have much more to say about him soon enough. <laughs> Meantime, a newer set of actors joined them, most notably Roddy McDowell as Sam, William Conrad as Denethor, Theodore Bikel as Aragorn, Casey Kasem as Mary, and Nellie Baleflower as Eowyn. As we noted in our episode on the Rankin-Bass Hobbit, it's still wildly unclear exactly how it was they were just able to go ahead with this while the formal rights were still with Saul Zance, according, leading to the Ralph Bakshi film. But a 1980 article in the L.A. Times that served as both a combined news story and a review of The Return of the King provided a little more detail, including word that Bakshi was at that time still planning to do a second and final Lord of the Rings film. Bakshi has a wonderfully tart quote, my life isn't going to be altered by what Rankin Bask chooses to do badly, end quote. <laughs> Rankin himself is quoted as saying that he liked Bakshi's version himself, but refers to the many adaptations of A Christmas Carol that have been done over the years and says, quote, people take each on their own terms, end quote. All of this came to a head with a lawsuit from both Zance and the Tolkien estate to prevent the airing of The Return of the King, but per a quote from one of the Tolkien estate's lawyers, the suit was settled amicably, as Orianda basically suggested more like profitably, <laughs> allowing broadcast to take place. If anything, maybe the estate had a hunch about how the adaptation was going to be received. Suffice to say, it was not as notable success, critically and in ratings terms, as their version of The Hobbit, and we'll go into why here soon enough. Now, Rankin Bass continued with their Japanese animation partners and other regulars for a fantasy theatrical feature two years later, a version of Peter Beagle's The Last Unicorn, while The Return of the King itself turned up in syndication every so often, and did get eventual videotape and DVD releases. But as noted, it's not formally stre on streaming at HBO Max, uh, though it's interesting what you can find if you Google for it in the Internet Archive, shall we say. Link in show notes. In terms of overall legacy, a quote from an interview of Rankin from 2003 by Rankin-Bass scholar Rick Goldschmidt may suffice. After a discussion of The Hobbit, which Rankin was clearly still quite proud of, Goldschmidt asked after The Return of the King, leading to this extended answer. We try to do Return of the King, but it is an awful lot to put into it. I think Peter Jackson is having the same problems in his films. You can't deviate from these books, or somebody will wait on the street for you. In The Return of the King, we had to summarize what had happened before, and then put it all together in two hours. It's not a very good film, end quote. <laughs> but I'll end on this point at least. As I've mentioned a couple of times over the years on this podcast, The Rankin-Bass Hobbit was my introduction to that book and Tolkien in general. Similarly, The Rankin-Bass Return of the King, which I did see on its original broadcast, and I also ended up with a truncated single-album version of the film's audio track soon after, was my introduction to The Lord of the Rings in general. So that's, it's true, yes. At the age of nine, I arguably had the whole climax of the sweeping story that is that book served up to me as a truly weird, not very successful, choppy, tone-shifting, overly simplistic, and overly complicated mess. And thanks <laughs> to that record, uh, in particular, I knew it that way for years before I read the actual books. In retrospect, I really do regret that I never got to experience the story properly the f for the first time through. Not knowing exactly how it might end, no cliffhangers such as with the end of the two towers, or with Pippin crushed before the Black Gate, where we're still unclear what else had happened elsewhere to Frodo at all. I can't say my memories of this version of The Return of the King hold, I hold anywhere near as fondly as that for the Rankin-Bass Hobbit, but they're memories, and I have to own them. But I should stop here and open up the floor. Well, well, well. <laughs> <laughs> you survived. <laughs> I just want to say it took me four entire days to get through this movie. I kept watching chunks and even like within the four days, I would like watch a chunk of 10 minutes and go, well, surely that's like most of the movie, <laughs> even though like story wise, but it, it just felt eternal in really, really bad ways. Mm. That's my Chunks. first little opening they, opening salvo. Uh, Chunks is a good way to describe that movie, yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> and Jared, uh, uh. your wails of pain at the end of the last episode when we announced this were, uh, <laughs> were very entertaining. Uh, you, you survived. <laughs> 
Yeah. Did you, did you know that the Seattle hockey team, the Kraken, has a giant tentacle that they put wheel out on the ice for the pregame show? I just think that's a fun fact. <laughs> and I'd rather talk about that, to be honest. <laughs> Thank no, you. I hated it. <laughs> well, you know, it's I did see this before, you know, watching it for for this episode. I like my brother, I got my brother into Lord of the Rings. He's about five and a half years younger than me. And I do remember very distinctly us I don't I guess we must have gotten our parents to rent it for us because we didn't have cable or anything. So it's not mm-hmm. like it was on TV. So we must have gotten our parents to rent it for us. And I remember watching it and being like, what? I think that was my first <laughs> the first time I had come across an adaptation that was really faithful in terms of like dialogue. And we've talked about this with the Bakshi version of, mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings, uh, you know, but something that can be really faithful in terms of dialogue and kind of the way characters look while still biffing everything <laughs> and mm-hmm. not working at all. Although there are some departures here from Tolkien that are truly baffling, like Gandalf being just, just giving himself to despair constantly yeah. mm-hmm. which is really incorrect and i don't understand <laughs> the opposite why of his entire function in the story <laughs> yeah it just it totally betrays the narrative function of yeah. gandalf and it's just like bewildering the gate will never stand up to that thing like the arm of the devil himself when the gates break i shall be there to greet it have my steed shadow facts made ready Farewell, Pippin. I go with you, sir. Then we leave this life together. Come, little one. I I was taking, I watched it all in one go, you know, ripped the bandit all off at once, and my <laughs> notes get, like, progressively more and more anguished in all caps. Because <laughs> um, it's not good. It's not good. Really I would go so far as to say it's bad. <laughs> I, 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 one of my notes to myself uh, is I deeply, profoundly hate this movie and every single one of its choices outside <laughs> of the depiction of or outside of the design of the orcs, which like oh, I, I know they're bad, like, <laughs> but I do appreciate that they're not racist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, I really do appreciate that. Like, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I knew I, I knew I probably wasn't going to like it going in. I just because I've I've seen the clip from the, the where there's a whip, there's a white song, which I feel like a lot of people like. I wanted to pull my ears off. See, I <laughs> so, think it bangs. I think yeah, it like know, divorced from the context. <laughs> I know, I know. People think that. I think they're wrong. <laughs> but we're wrong. <laughs> I think you're wrong. I'm sorry. It's just so you're out allowed of left to think field. I'm wrong. So wrong. Um, <laughs> the the pacing, the di- everything ooh, is ooh. everything is wrong. It's a it's a miracle that they made like two correct choices in the entire thing. And like one of one of those is that Minas Tirith looks really cool. Like that's, yeah. that and the design of the orcs. And I think uh, oh the black gate looks good too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it is yeah, the pacing. The pacing is a nightmare. The pacing that makes no sense at all. Yeah, there's like Sam and Frodo are at the Tower of Curious Ungle for half of the movie. Yeah. And they keep leaving and coming back while the Battle of the Pelennor Fields is going on. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and uh, my favorite my favorite bit along those lines, and this is something this is something I should note that I, I really didn't remember now. A little more context. I mentioned about how I had the single album uh, re- redaction, if you will, of it uh, on vinyl. Whereas, as I mentioned in the uh, episode we did in The Hobbit, I had a vinyl set that was the entire production of The Hobbit. So I had the audio uh-huh. production of The Hobbit, had the audio elements of it, as I could listen to, again, pre-widespread you know, videotape days, etc., things like that. Yeah. So I knew the whole story of The Hobbit as presented by Rankin Bass through that. It was sort of a case of, okay, I've got a sense of it, and you know, match up with images, whereas uh, whereas they didn't do that for the uh, Return of the King. They just did the single mm-hmm. album thing. If there was a larger one, I haven't heard about it. And then, trust me, I haven't bothered Google looking for it on Discogs. So uh, <laughs> so for me, it's sort of like there was a lot of. Um, 
There's a lot, and the last time I saw this, there was the first time I saw it, actually saw it, and then I saw it again sometime in the mid-90s, and like randomly was on syndication on TV, I'm like, eh, what is it like? And I was like, <laughs> ooh, huh. <laughs> no, that, that was, I, I didn't, hadn't gone back since. So there was a lot, I knew I knew there was stuff that uh, that I had forgotten about, because whereas I got that you know record version, again, when I was nine, I played it a lot. That's in my brain, but uh, not the entire script. So there, I knew there were elements that were missing. And I, you know, it comes near the end, but it truly sums it all up. Is the fact that we have we have Sam and Frodo get to Mount Doom. Frodo puts the ring on. Then we have things like, and then Sam searched for many days throughout Mount yeah, Doom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> Just to sync what up was, everything and in their what? timeline. <laughs> Even worse is Frodo puts the ring on, and then we cut, and then we go away from that storyline for. Like twenty five full right. minutes. Yeah. While you know, a bunch of stuff happens. I think it goes back to the. It goes back to the battle. It goes back to Theoden. It goes back to Eowyn. Yeah, it goes yeah, back yeah. to all that. Yeah. And and Eowyn and stuff. That is the climax of the film. Is Frodo putting on the ring and essentially yeah. failing in his quest? That's the, that's the moment of like, oh no, this is going wrong. Something bad is going to happen now. But then. It goes back. And it just goes, and we just, we're just left, and all of a sudden, Eowyn is a character who exists Mm -hmm. because they forgot. (laughs) I'm, you know, I know they didn't forget, but every every single character is like that, though, too. Aragorn? Aragorn, like, oh, right, he's gonna come be the king, and it's like, well, who is that? Like, who's Aragorn? You don't know. Or, like, Denethor gets one scene, and Gandalf just kind of stands there while he kills himself. Like, it's, they're just introduced because they're in the book. Not mm-hmm. because they serve any function in the story. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how it yeah. feels for some of these things. Like, you could take Denethor out and the movie would be the same. Yeah. Most of this, none. Of, there's no actual cohesion in, yeah. like, the series of events that plays out. And, like, yeah. I, that, that quote from Rankin where he's like, oh, you know, if you, like, deviate too much from the books, people, like, beat you up. Uh, yeah. Is, like, I think actually the problem is that you made a bad move. It, it yeah. has nothing to do with the fact that it was like, yeah, you botched some stuff like, you know, Gandalf being the uh, n- negative Nancy, but, yeah. but you know, stuff like that. If, if you had made a film that like added to the value of, of this work, I think people would be more forgiving of stuff like that. Yeah. I do think pretty much, 75 percent or so of the problems are just the way the screenplay is structured that's literally yeah. or it's not, not it, structured as yeah because it's not like they include the the temptation scene with sam where he's like picturing himself as samwise the great striking across mordor and like turning it into a garden and all that and that's fine but that is a gigantic chunk of the movie for no yeah. real reason right Right. And it's it's not it's important, but it's not important enough that you have to include it if there's other things you could be doing with that time, like mm-hmm. Aragorn doing anything with Aragorn or <laughs> or whatever. And there's the whole like the really bananas prologue where they're like telling Bilbo the story of their adventures. Yeah. <laughs> which is like, wow, kill way to kill any suspense over how this turns out. They're all here yeah. and we know Frodo yeah. lost a finger. It is really bizarre, yeah. We if you haven't seen it and we we don't blame you if you have <laughs> so is that yeah, Jared is exactly right. Um we get the structure of it is truly you know, I am trying to keep this in mind. They're thinking, okay, how do we introduce the story to a mass audience? In a weird way, their version of the Hobbit just sort of like, okay, sitting in the past and there's a Hobbit and here's a wizard comes up and we have an adventure. They actually do a right in the same way that Tolkien has no prologue for yeah. explaining what the Hobbit is. I mean, there's the little concerning, there's the one page of it that I guess that's there, which is uh, sort of there, but I think that was almost added later. It's more so like, okay, here it, here it is and we go for this. Whereas here we've got Gandalf, <laughs> who essentially is the narrator of this movie. Yeah. <laughs> Which is something that was not the case with the Hobbit adaptation. So that that's 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 another factor here. With a very weird prologue scene, as noted, where it's sort of like you see Mount Doom is the first thing. Then we see the Nazgul on these uh Pegasi. <gasps> yeah. yeah. Except for when it isn't like it's so weird. They're 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 these flying hell horses, and then all of a sudden it's like they realized, oh whoopsie, actually it's <laughs> supposed to be a fell beast. The, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So it turns into a fell beast 
for the scene where Eowyn yeah. chops the, and then and then they're back to, to hell horses. Yeah, I was about to say, that portrayal of what the Nazgul look like, because there are illustrations in that record, as I mentioned, and things like that. It's sort of like, is that what the Nazgul are like? And then I read the book later, I'm like, hmm. <laughs> so, you know, mm. slightly different. Um, so you get that. Then you then you have Gandalf on, on Shadowfax. I, I do love the fact we get Shadowfax mentioned, even though there's no real sense of the import of that at all <laughs> yeah. in the movie. It's like, here's my horse. It's like, great. <laughs> so, <let's see>. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Huzzah. So, but uh, we have Gandalf on Shadowfax looking out over at Mount Doom while the Nazgul flying around and basically doing nothing. Now, it's meant to be more an imagistic portrayal of like, you know, opposing forces as opposed to what really happened. But still, it is incredibly confusing. <laughs> it's sort yeah. of like, what's happening here? What's going on? Where are we? <laughs> what is and then we get and then we get this wonderfully florid speech from Gandalf about like, you know, great things of cosmic magnificence or something like oh, that. God. I forget the exact wording. It was just really bizarre about like, you know, of ancient kings and a hero and a king will return. It's like thank you for spoiling the whole story. Sure, the return of the king famously spoils the story. But this really spoils the story. Hear you now, a story of good against evil. An epoch that has its beginning and an ending, and ends at a beginning. Listen as we speak of the fall of a lord of darkness and the return of a king of light. Concern yourselves with armies and wizards, phantoms and emperors, cloud-capped towers and bloodied fields of horrendous carnage. Consider no less than the cataclysmic transformation of that ancient world of wonder and magic to the world we know now of man. And then, and then we go back to, and then, and then, yeah, we, as Jared pointed out. Then we're in Rivendell. We're in the ski chalet version of the last homely house, which I had forgotten <laughs> it was like that in The Hobbit. It shows it like that in The Hobbit, but this gives it more detail. I was like going, "Uh, what am I looking at?" And uh, and then and then and then yeah, it's sort of like everything's happy now, and now we're remembering, which in and of itself is not necessarily a bad way to structure things in terms of how one tells a story. It happens all the time, but it's not how Lord of the Rings is told. <laughs> it's like you know, it really well, and it, you could, there is a world. In in which that work because there are so many movies I see and books that I read and I'm I'm rewatching and rereading them and there is still tension. Like every time I watch mm-hmm. Fellowship of the Ring, the Casa Doom sequence is extremely tense, and there is part of me that is like, maybe it'll be different this time. <laughs> like, you know, I do still feel like I am still in grossed by Mm -hmm. the narrative even though technically i know what's going to happen yeah so you can do it but not when you tell a story that is not a story this is not it's just not the way you've told the story is not a story yeah a huge part of it is just moving forward with the narrative and this keeps looping back to do things that aren't necessary to not totally walk back what I was talking about earlier, it doesn't really necessarily matter that you're spoiled on whether they survive the story. Mm. But like the fact that there's the Gandalf speech and then the Rivendell thing. And then, Oh, now we brought this minstrel from Gondor for some reason. To, it's like, this is too many frames <laughs> yes. to get to the story. Yes. And you're just spending time on this. Yeah. And you could, there's a way to do it. I'm sure where it actually like establishes the characters and the setting right. and all of that. Right. But they didn't do that. No. They did something else. They, they did this. And <laughs> they did this instead. I, like, it is <laughs> just the, the things that they do and do not spend time on, mm-hmm. you know, where there's a whip, there's a way bangs, but did we need it? No, of course not. And, you know, we spent whole minutes talking about the male shirt that Fro- like Frodo, you know, mm, yeah. the male shirt is yeah. very ha- and it's like... That we, doesn't actually matter for it doesn't what's matter. going on in this doesn't, story? Doesn't at all and, like, it's time we could have spent setting up Aragorn or mm-hmm. Eowyn or I like yeah. I don't want anything to do with Merry and Pippin. They're just a shrieking nightmare. Oh, uh, I hate them in this movie. <laughs> Casey Kasem and 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 Sonny uh, Melendres have 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 a lot to answer for. Yeah, oh, it's a nightmare wherever they are. You know, <laughs> I don't like you still owe a karmic debt. But as we celebrated Farn of the Elvish Night, we found it difficult to keep our aging guest of honor awake. Nay, Pippa, not till Bilbo has cut it. Blast! What a time to fall asleep! 
<laughs> when I realized years later that it was Casey Kasem doing that, because right. you know, I'm I'm both because famously, of course, yes, Shaggy uh, in Scooby Doo, and it was for years, and of course, also I, you know, me being a musicalist and all that, America's Top Forty and all of that. Of course. So so putting that together and hearing his voice come out of Mary's uh, face, I was like, what? When I realized that was the case, it was deeply disorienting. So yeah, I mean, do you get the right of the thing? But part, you know, part of to, to allow them one thing with their messy, let's finally get the story going thing at the beginning. <laughs> They did have to do one thing, which was in the context of late seventies viewing, you had to deal with people who might vaguely have remembered that they saw the Hobbit the one time, or maybe on the mm-hmm. repeat, and needed some sort of quick pressy about what happened to that, especially the key stuff involving the Ring and Gollum and things like mm-hmm. this. That I buy because yeah. that's you know often been the case with any other adaptation. They have to put it in there. Obviously, Jackson did it. It's in the BBC radio version, et cetera, et cetera. You've got to have some element of that there. Yeah. So you much allow for that. There. Start yeah, there. Start yeah. there. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's just sort of like, you know, it's it's sort of like, you know, and it, it is, and yeah, the structure at the beginning is really weird. It's almost like we get some credits, we seem like we have to go, and then we do loop back, and then we get the rest yeah. of the credits, and the thing, and yeah. the... Uh, and the and the great thing the great thing is that we see uh, is that we see Frodo and Sam like go off in the little walking across the map as they're doing their journey okay <laughs> and you know Merry and Pippin just appear later why you know yeah. they, yeah. they could have shown all four of them going together you know that was not that hard so yeah. and uh, and you know, you might notice that none of us have been talking about Legos and Gimli for a good reason they're not in this and maybe we should be lucky right <laughs> I don't know I kind of miss the like dead eyed mannequin Legolas from the Bakshi version I kind of <laughs> wanted to see him again I know he wouldn't be in this because whatever but I, I kind of miss that the things that they spend time on that they don't need to are all things that I kind of like in the book, mm, like the mm. temptation scene, or like there's this, mm. there's so much time spent with the watchers at the tower right. of Curie yeah. Thumble. And I love the watchers in the book. They are terrifying and they're never explained. And that's so cool. They're just kind of a menace, but mm, you yes. don't need them to be there. But mm. this is like half of the movie. It feels like is dealing with the watchers yes. when they are not that important. <laughs> Yeah, their texture, their texture, not the substance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does that make any sense at all? (laughs) Yeah. They're a moment that are locked into, but there's uh, the the unnecessarily, as Jared has pointed out. Um, Yeah. I mean, the design, I think, is pretty good on them, but you could have just done that in a couple of shots and just let, let it go. Yeah. Yeah. Also, everything is mis, literally everything is mispronounced. Everything. Yeah. Siri Thungol, I think Gorug, Gorogoroth. The, okay, why do they keep co- talking about the Gorogoroth? Because, like, first of all, mispronounced, but also why? No one cares that it's called the Gorogor. Like, no, stop doing things that no one actually cares about. It it does kind of remind me of some of the stuff that was in the Amazon Lord of the, the Rings show, where it's like, why are you? This is like deep like this, this doesn't is not matter yeah mm-hmm. this is just mm-hmm. you tossing in a name for cred it feels yeah. like and then in this case mispronouncing it every single time it's like when you're assigned a paper in in school and you're and the rules are like you have to cite at least three sources or whatever <laughs> so to make up that additional source you cite like a funny quote rather than an actual like you just have to like prove the that dictionary. you read something yeah yeah it's just filler it doesn't actually add anything to the paper and this is a lot of what this movie is like so much of it so i mean there's there there's this weird feeling and i can see why especially in the perspective of history why this movie and why the, both well that and bakshi's uh production why everything is just so convoluted as as i was reminded yeah. of uh, in a quick wikipedia check what happened was is that Warner Brothers essentially bought out or got the rights after Rankin Bass, the company, you know, essentially wrapped up or collapsed or folded or whatever happened in 87. So they got the rights to it. That therefore meant that they had the rights to essentially all three Tolkien animated films of the late 70s, which they proceeded to put together and almost be like, uh, it's like a trilogy and like later packaging releases, which is not really the case, of course. <laughs> and uh, but. What what happens is is that because of the weird nature of everything was done, how sort of like how Bakshi could only take it up to a certain point and couldn't do it any further. So we're still on our way to Shelob, but we never mm-hmm. see Shelob. Mm-hmm. And then here, what they decided to do is, and this is the part that still confuses me, among the many things confusing me about what they chose to do with rights and where to start and everything like that, is that it, it seems like they they. 
my sense of it from some of those Rankin quotes and some of the other things going on is that they thought that they were trying to do the one I didn't I didn't quote this another thing from that interview in 2003 he quoted is that when, he, when Goldschmidt asked him why didn't you just try and adapt the whole thing if your argument was you had the rights to the whole thing why didn't you try and do that and Rankin's response is well we didn't think the audience would sit still for it we were wrong. So, uh-huh. okay. And, you know, and therefore that leaves the Bakshi film, which again is in its own universe and can say like, Hey, we have actual rights here, you know, mm-hmm. to go ahead and do its plan, even though it was, had its own issues with execution, blah, blah, blah. I bring all this up. The weird feeling here though, is that it almost feels like there was a hard carve out on Rankin Bass's part to say like, okay, we will do the return of the King. We'll start exactly here. And mm-hmm. we won't even reference anything before it in the first <laughs> uh-huh. two books, which is so Weird. So you get yeah. things like you see Frodo and then Sam going through these tunnels around Sierra Thunkel. Gee, there's some big spider webs around. What yeah. are what they're mm-hmm. from? You know, no sense in them at all. And then, of course, we have the great moment, speaking of the Watchers, where it's like, oh, I've got this file here. Okay, one, you're a kid. <laughs> you know, it's like, isn't a file something you use for your nails? You know, yeah. if you don't know what that is, you only hear that. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. And then, two, when the file is revealed, it's the file of Gladriel. Gladriel. <laughs> Not Galadriel. <laughs> and, then, and then when Sam wants to know more about it, uh, I can't explain or its power would fall apart. I also have found Sting. Might I keep it with me a little longer? See, I have the strength to use it, and, and you, with your wound and all. Yes, yes, of course, dear Sam. And your cloak, which I wear. In a pocket, I found this. It has powers. It got me past the Watchers. What is it? The file of Gladriel. I can say no more. But if I betray the trust and give the secret, its powers will die. I understand. Right, right. That was insane to me. I was like, why did you even bring this up if you're just, like, it can just be a magic thing. It can just be like, oh, it's a source of goodness and light. And that's all. Why do you introduce, why introduce this idea of you know, oh, the power might fall apart, and then it never comes up again. Mm-hmm. Why? Especially since it's not even, if you take it out of, like, it's really only important for the two towers. In Return of the King, it kind of matters a little bit for, like, emotional and metaphorical purposes. Sure. But, like, if you don't do the Watchers, and you don't need to do the Watchers, you don't need to include the file either. Mm-hmm. So, you're making such a big deal out of it, when it doesn't, have, it doesn't matter for the story that you're trying to tell, mm-hmm. or uh, maybe not even trying, honestly. Like, <laughs> <laughs> minimal effort put into the storytelling here. They put an, in, you know, it looked like an Instagram, like the first Instagram filter. Uh, <laughs> it really does all sorts of things swirling around. Just and a it does collision put of lens flares. <laughs> <laughs> and it does put me in mind of Jackson's, uh, you know, Jackson's first scene, where I know they, my understanding is they did actually film more with the Watchers for that. Mm-hmm. Um, you but can they see basically, them in- yeah, yeah mm-hmm. you, but you see them, and wisely, what happens is, is that they basically realize, you know, and as Jared was pointing out, its impact is more in two tower stuff. Which, given the bleed over in the films, that moment where you know it, it lights things up and the connections there happens in Wish Lob as it does in the story there, we get that in the film, however slightly differently handled. And so the point is, yeah, you don't need it anymore by the time Sam comes to it. So basically, just one of those things that's sort of creepy, and you basically the cut allows you to see Sam has gone through the gate, and that's all you need. Mm-hmm. You don't need anything else here. You don't get that. <laughs> nope, you <laughs> Not get at all. So much so, of it. Oh. And, Way and more than you ever thought possible, given the <laughs> role in the story. I mean, let's let's okay, let's let's maybe sort of shift a, a touch into some of the casting uh, a bit, but we can throw another context too, because a lot of the scene is basically we get a lot of Sam. We get yes. a lot of Roddy McDowell as Sam. We get him, first of all, essentially, once we get into the retelling of the story in heavy, heavy amounts. And, of course, the bizarre <laughs> scene where he somehow finds the ring just next to the gate. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Like, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't yeah. it just be there? It's only the most important thing. And, again, yeah. the, the, the one ring is treated as something that sounds honestly very important and incredibly casual. As yes. noted with the scene where he puts it on later and things like that. It's like... What's going on here? And so also, one of the first... he just kind of really quickly in the tower yeah. when he encounters that orc? Doesn't he just kind of be like, I've got the ring. It's going to command you. Like, basically, yeah. he doesn't he just pull it out? Am I misremembering? Yeah, yeah I think he just yeah, holds, yeah. It. He he holds, just, holds it to him. But it's like yeah. there. Yeah. It's, yeah. Not, it's visible. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Anyway, then, go on. 
And then no, and then one of the first things we get is we have, after we get a sequence where we see where we see Sam animated throwing himself at a gate like three or four times oh in a row God, and falling that over. Oh my God, that drove me crazy. <laughs> just like, Why? just like, bam. okay, if you're making Sam bam. seem like an idiot, well done. But you didn't need to demonstrate that, I guess, and you didn't need to make Sam early in it. Poor Sam, he's so ill served over many of these yeah. adaptations. Yeah. It really is. Thank, thank goodness, Sean Heston. Please, thank you. You gave him the dignity he needed. Um, so Bill Nye too, and the BBC, but we'll get to that. Um, to also. So the first thing he says, we discover, again, the ring sitting by the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and his first line is, you, I can feel you throbbing with excitement. And I'm like, this God. is not helping. <laughs> this is not helping at all. <laughs> you cannot die, Master Frodo. I'll get to you somehow. <sighs> I can feel you throbbing with excitement. Who, like, I know Romeo Muller, like, you know, he wrote a lot of the classic, the Christmas classics that we Mm -hmm. all love and a lot of other sort of the holiday related specials and Puff the Magic Dragon and, you know, that's great. But uh, I think this is like a classic case of someone who is completely unmatched here. Yep. Completely. Uh, just does not understand how to structure and like fair enough this is a lot of material to to adapt but um you biffed it man this is yeah it feels a lot like like he wrote a draft and didn't realize he could edit it at all yeah Mm -hmm. and somebody was like like rushed to write to filming and then they had to add little lines like he's been wandering the caves for days or whatever to, to like explain why it is the way it is it just doesn't it doesn't feel finished. Mm-mm. Really doesn't. Yeah. <sighs> and then, like you know, just to just to go over some of the other, like maybe more structural things, and then uh, I think move on to some more drill down moments here. Um, uh, some other things too is that yeah, we get we get the basic set of a minus Tirith. Okay, the bad guys are attacking. Arguably, kind of all you need. Fine, yeah. but the, but the more more you get into it, as noted, we have Gandalf being a source of despair more than anything else. You know, everything seems to bring mm-hmm. him down. We have the one scene with Denethor, and frankly, you know, with time, you know, this this Denethor again has no dignity, and it's yeah. a very mm-hmm. it really doesn't suit. It's you know, the, the, Denethor as anything is rock rigid, despairing. He's certainly collapsing internally, but to have him be basically the equivalent of some like you know, <laughs> dirty old man with like yeah. missing teeth and all like that, a, yeah. like a like, He-Man villain. Cannot do this. Nay, nay, soon all shall be burned. The West has failed. It shall go up in a great fire, and all shall be ended. Ash, ash and smoke blown away on the wind. All shall not be ended. Theoden's forces are on their way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very. yes good comparison yes. i'll buy that which so, i yeah. think actually didn't didn't romeo muller write uh wouldn't be surprised <laughs> so, yeah. i don't know if it was he-man or if oh it's like strawberry shortcake thundercats not he-man never mind <laughs> it's all that same world yeah <laughs> right the romeo muller cinematic universe so, <laughs> so 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 we get moments like that we get uh grand coming up fine yeah we get we get that the confrontation cool. yeah fine yeah <laughs> so, yeah ish we get the confrontation at the gate we get we get uh, we get a very bad lord of the nazgul i'm sorry okay. yeah. <laughs> that, no. and, Living man can kill me. You cannot enter here. Go back to the abyss prepared for you. Go back. Fall to the nothingness that awaits you and your master. Go. <laughs> oh, fool. This is my hour. Do you not know? But like, yeah. Uh, so. yeah, it's the production on his voice. They did the wrong choice. I mean, circus in Jackson's work, you know, they take it more lower key. It's more spectral and haunting. It's sort of mm-hmm. like, you know, 
you could argue it's what the tools they had to hand, but this was not the right way to do it. <laughs> this this <laughs> hollowed yeah. mechanistic, I'm a malfunctioning robot Yeah, <laughs> you know, in Lord of the Nazgul doesn't work. Theoden is just there. Eowyn is just there. We have no idea of any of their backstories. We have no idea why it's important at all. Nope. Eowyn is, design-wise, interestingly, is as close to an anime heroine as is, yeah. is <laughs> shown in anything. You do see a lot more of, dare I say, and it was already present in The Hobbit, certainly, but you get a lot of the Japanese animated influence mm-hmm. throughout this entire yeah. thing, which is not in and of itself bad. So you get that. Aragorn is a non-entity. He's just the guy who's wandering somewhere with a company who then shows up on the boat, and now he's the king. There's nothing yeah. more to it. There's zero nope. else. He just simply is. It's like, thanks. You know? And he just like, seems yay, to be slightly... Yeah, got a different. king. Cool. Hooray. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, wow. you know, I have a beard. Like, I'm crusty. You know, it's... You it, have it, to... It's, you have to explain to us why it matters that this guy is a king now. Like, no, we have to spend five minutes on Frodo trying on a male shirt and <laughs> yeah. carrying it around and finding yeah. it too heavy. Yeah. Jesus. Any, any context for Aragorn would be appreciated at all. And if I remember correctly, I don't think Denethor even brings it up. No, he doesn't. He's like, he's like, here's the you know the fleet with black sails. You're all doomed, all that. But he he never goes like... He never says, this would be the perfect opportunity mm-hmm. to learn about the history of Gondor, like why it's an issue, that they don't have a king, that kind of thing. But no, he's just there because the script calls for Denethor to appear. Right. And, it, and then but, to go away. <laughs> yeah, and then go, like, literally, I, I can't <laughs> emphasize enough how bananas it is that he's like, I'm going to kill myself. And Gandalf is just like, cool. Uh, okay. Go <laughs> ahead. Or, or, like, or, or, or you get the one bit with Pippin talking to the guard. You must stop him. His word is law. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Great. Uh, well done. Why am I here? <laughs> Why am I helping you people? <laughs> there's nothing below any of the line readings. There's no actual mm-hmm. emotion beneath mm-hmm. any of this. And it's mm-hmm. just so infuriating. So everybody is very much there just to get a paycheck. <laughs> yeah. Except for the background painters. Yeah, well, more more to say about that in a bit for sure. So, but yeah, no, I mean, other things, other things we find out that Mary has been dispatched to go get to Theoden and bring him along, which is like, uh, okay, sure. And I again, don't mind that. I just, I don't, not does, necessarily either. Yeah, yeah it but it's like, land correctly, but I don't mind really, it. Really doesn't. Um, you know, the action scenes, we get a whole lot of like, you know, climbing up and falling off the battlements and things yeah. like that. You mm-hmm. know, things, repeated shots over and over again. I understand that for budget reasons, but still, um, it's all, yeah, I know. It, it, it's just it's just a weird thing. Let's delve into a real problem here. Now, talking <laughs> about some of the casting. So here's something here's something we didn't talk about in our Rankin Bass Hobbit episode. And even though he's very ill used here, a little shine because we really didn't talk. We talked about Orson Bean a fair amount, and so we did not talk about John Huston as Gandalf. I actually don't like him as Gandalf. <laughs> okay, which is fair. I'm sorry. So yeah, well, what what doesn't work for you and all that? So I'm I'm neutral on him. I, I guess a lot of it is the characterization bleeding over into the performance, but I find him so stiff. Yeah, uh, he's just too seem... stiff for me. He's just too stiff yeah. for me. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. probably not John Huston's fault. Like, that's probably just the character is bad. So didn't yeah. really have much to work with. But there's no warmth. There's no mm-hmm. spark. There's no joy. It's just... I am Ganda. You know. Yeah, he <laughs> comes across really... as extremely detached from what's going on. Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like he's just kind of observing it, and that's it. Uh, but yeah, that the warmth is missing. I like John Huston and other things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually his his Gandalf in the Hobbit is not bad. I didn't have these feelings about him in the Hobbit. I guess because he gets to be kind of a bit sort of sharper in a fun way when he's like, I can't be bothering with you people (laughs) anymore. I have other things to do and it's fun. But here it's like, no, this is like a very serious situation and you're supposed to be the warm light that these people like flock to. Or Mm -hmm. even like encouraging in a kind of like, like, Oh my God, get your life together kind of way. Mm -hmm. But he's Mm -hmm. not, he's just kind of like, Oh, he's dead. Okay. Yeah. Guess I'd better sit here. Like that's, (laughs) That's the Gandalf. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Orson Bean as Frodo is doing the best he can. Uh, yeah. He, he yeah. worked better with Bilbo, I think, in The Hobbit. He captured Bilbo pretty well, I thought, uh, in, the, in that, that version of it in, in The Hobbit. Here is Frodo. He's trying. Mm-hmm. But he's sort of let down by everything around him, I guess is the yeah. best way to put it. Well, so, you yeah. know, I think the, the, like, key here is one of Frodo's most 
the most bestest <laughs> lines is, you know, I'm glad you're here with me at the end of all things. And that line is said while Frodo and Sam are running. Mm-hmm. But of course, like Orson Bean's voice is not out of breath or ragged. Yeah. And like, that's the wrong choice anyway. They can't be running. Like, that's weird. It's no use. The lava will have us. I'm glad you are with me here at the end of all things, Sam. And you with me, Master. Oh, but I don't want to give up yet. It's it's not like me somehow, if you understand. Maybe not, Sam. But it's like things are in the world. Hopes fail. An end comes. It all sounds like a table read to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like yep. everything. Even I don't even Orson being in the Hobbit, I felt like I maybe I'm the minority here, but like especially here though, he mm-hmm. he just sounds like he's like, Okay, here's my line. Now I gotta wait for Roddy McDowell to <laughs> flip to the page <laughs> yeah. and say his line, and now I'm gonna say my line, and there's no like they had the, the, the voice recording studio for a day and that's it. Like they couldn't go redo anything. It's just and there was no one directing them, yeah. it sounds like. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's no mm-hmm. sense that this is actually, that any of these are a performance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're just kind of people reading lines. Theodore as Gollum is nice to have back oh, and all yes. that. No, because, oh, he's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, no, yeah, I yeah. Was, the second he came back, I was like, oh, thank God, some character. <laughs> because of the way that that wonderful, yeah, you know, that again, that uh, as you described, uh, Jared, we talked about him in the Hobbit, the sense that he maybe hadn't spoken for like a thousand years yeah. when you first yeah. hear his voice. Oh, I and loved that, him so much, and now he's just sort of like you know, it's 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 a pity the design essentially hasn't changed because you know, a Gollum was like that sign, but even more racked and like you know, just you know, mm-hmm. just still yeah. like you know, he's still see. like plump, which is weird. He's still, yeah. Yeah. still yeah. Been yeah. kind he's of starving for the last time. Of <laughs> yeah. He looks like a frog. It's I don't know. Yeah, it is is odd there, but yeah, no theater theater. Or delivers. I mean, he delivers the the line. He I always thought his diversion delivery, which again we don't get this in the Jackson film. The die into the dust yes. sequence. Yes, and all yes. That, you know, that I thought, was yes. good. Gollum, Gollum, I love Gollum, Gollum, lost, lost. We are lost. And when precious goes, we'll die. Yes, all of us die into the dust. Die into the dust. You know, it's it sells that moment very, very well. You know, just sort of uh, because he's just you know, he's he sees more clearly maybe than even Frodo and Sam do at this point what exactly is going to happen no matter what happens, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's the power of it in the book. And here, the theater does a very good version of doing that and some other moments along the way. Um, so credit to him. Yeah, the theater Bickel is Aragorn. Nothing. <laughs> so, yeah, but... uh, I forgot he even spoke. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> I, I I was afraid they were going to not have him speak at all because it just we were like three quarters of the way through the movie. It felt like and he hadn't mm-hmm. arrived or spoken or I was like, oh, are they not going to have the king in the return of the king? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, oh, you know what? I would love a fantasy book that was like all about the return of a king. It's the, the the fantasy version of waiting for Godot. A little bit like that. Like maybe he's there, but no, he's never actually on the page. I'm sure this book must exist somewhere, but like, <laughs> I think that would be very funny if they're like, Oh my God, the king is back. And you just never, it doesn't even matter. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a inverse version of the, uh, the painting waiting for the barbarians or something. So uh, yeah, <laughs> that could be good. So, well, let's talk about the character and the setup and the thing that is most just what, why how and that is the minstrel of gondor and the song used throughout the entire thing (sighs) so having gotten glenn yarborough (laughs) in the hobbit and all that they decide to make him a character in this one even a partial narrator at one point (laughs) and uh and then and then the, the 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 terrible structure of this whole thing is interrupted by all these terrible songs (laughs) yes oh in my notes right in the middle First, all caps is this is not the right time for a song. It's <laughs> never the right time for these songs. Never. One small garden of a free gardener is all my need and you. My own hands to use. 
not the hands of others to command. Less can be more, and small can be beautiful, for life isn't all. Just big and wonderful What do I need When you get right down to it They're all awful. (laughs) So what's so interesting to me about this choice is that it's one of those where, in theory, it does feel very Tolkienian Yeah, we talked about the musicality of Tolkien, I think, in the Hobbit episode, where it's like it's not inherently a bad idea to have all these songs. Absolutely. Like, yeah, oh, it's, you know, again, in theory, I like Mm -hmm. the idea of like, oh, it's like we're hobbit kids or something Mm -hmm. like being told, you know, being regaled by a a minstrel or a bard or whatever. And okay, okay. But then the execution is just horrendous. He's some kind of like horrible subpar D&D fop who just shows up. (laughs) And I love a fop. (laughs) I don't love this one. I think we have our episode title. (laughs) We might well. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, we, we either have more Glenn Barrero just riffs on the essential basic structure of the greatest adventure and, and Rhodes Grever on over and over and over again with different words, or we have rough voiced choirs uh, singing about either the sort of like. Of the ring. Oh my God. The wearer of the ring. The bearer of the ring. Or doing that, or actually, or or being like voices of the orcs, or singing along, and I mean, I had I had that s- the stupid. The, it's not even a song. Ha- it's a it's little not even couplet a couplet that, it but it, it wormed its way into my brain. And yeah. Ned, you'll have to answer for that at some point. Yeah, it feels <laughs> like it feels like somebody watched The Hobbit and then tried to write songs based yeah. on those songs with only having seen it once maybe on like a bad <laughs> like the signal was bad and it was all static like <laughs> it's they're so they're so bad and jules bass is the one who wrote the lyrics so blame him for that blame one oh, of the two main guys i so, do yeah let's let's lay, lay on the blame and part of the real problem is this too um they for the most part there is an obvious huge exception for the most part they stick with the model of what they did in the hobbit where the songs are not are not diegetic in other words no characters are singing them for the mm-hmm. most part, they're off screen, which is actually one of the wiser things they did in The Hobbit, I thought, and actually and lets it lets it add color to it. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, the big difference, of course, is that uh, unlike uh, in The Hobbit, where they took Tolkien's actual songs, his actual lyrics, all those songs, with the exception of Yarbo's two, like, you know, two big things, the, all the ones that are sung by the various choruses or other things throughout are, are actual Tolkien lyrics, essentially adapted. None of that is the case here. None of mm-hmm. it is all originals and they all fail. <laughs> and that's a, that, it really, it, it's a big disconnect. And so you get things like, you know, retreat, retreat from the, from the oh Towers of the Thief song. And, uh, you know, and uh, and then, yeah, the end of the ring, the end of the ring, the return of the king, you know, all that other stuff. And just, I'm sorry, I just keep making really pained horse noises. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course... <laughs> When there's a whip, there's a way, which, as you know, Oriana notes, is is the bizarre. All of a sudden, we get a funk bass line. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, do, do, it's do, it's do. totally. Jared, you're right in that it's totally inappropriate and and does not actually work in the movie at all. I don't look. Sometimes we like things that aren't good for us. <laughs> I just also I just don't like it. Like as a song. But I do so kind of following up on something I said earlier about they're spending times on spending time on things that I like like, but it's weird yeah, that they're spending yeah, this yeah. much time on it. Is and I think we talked about this actually in the Orc episode, but like this song, they're like, We don't want to go to war. Yeah. Like, right. 
this yeah. job sucks. We hate this. And it's like, that's such a valuable aspect of the orc characterization that's missing from the Jackson movies. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Completely agree. Like, yeah, and that's great. I just wish it wasn't in this song. <laughs> that is actually so. There's another. There's a related moment that uh, was called out actually in the L.A. Times. Ooh, I was uh, hoping somebody would bring this up. <laughs> where okay, I, again, you call me crazy, call me wrong, and um, but I actually kind of enjoyed the moment where Frodo is like hallucinating, having this like utopian vision. Yeah, mm-hmm. of like being back in the. Ch- Shire, or maybe it's like a fun, good Mordor. You know, Mordor is it's, has it's been Gorgoroth, restored, but it's been yeah, <laughs> it's been... season one ROP Gorgoroth. Yes, exactly. yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, Jesus. <laughs> um, but then there's like a pair of orcs that come and they wave they and just like wave. yeah, and I kind of like that. I think yeah. that's like the only moment that I truly enjoyed in mm-hmm. this movie where I'm like, yeah, I think that's like a really beautiful moment of characterization for Frodo in particular, where like he does, you know, he does not view the orcs as these either a mindless enemy or mm-hmm. or just mm-hmm. only a source of evil. He has sympathy for them as like yeah. fellow victims of the ring in a exactly. sense. Exactly. If we could, you know, we can have a beautiful world. Like, I wish that we could have this beautiful world mm-hmm. where we could just like chill out in a meadow and say hi. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. I, I did actually genuinely like that moment. I think the execution was not great because it no. is this movie, <laughs> but I, the conceptual, yeah, I totally, I was like, oh, that's like, it's really cheesy and silly, but also sure as an idea. Like, yeah. again, the execution is cheesy and silly, but as an idea, like, yeah, the orcs are not beyond re- redemption. Mm-hmm. They they don't want to be involved in this just as much as we don't want to be involved in mm-hmm. this. And I thought that was really, that was really nice. Mm-hmm. It looks Genuinely. really silly, but it, like, I saw it and I kind of went, aww. aww yeah. yeah. I mean, two of my, I agreed with all this completely. Um, uh, two of my, uh, two, you mentioned silly moments, two of my more sort of silly moments would have been one where... Instead of in the book where the idea is that Frodo and Scam escape from the orcs who have picked them up essentially along the way because there's confusion because a couple of orc bands have come together. They're mm-hmm. trying to get in the race, and there's just a muddle. So yeah. it's sort of like – and they slip out under cover of that. Um, it's a little different than the Jackson version, but you know, not too far removed. Here, it's a little more deliberate and weird where yeah. you have the orcs running on the immediate troop of men. We've learned about orc, orc versus men racism, I guess, or something yeah. like that. I did – I liked that. I liked that Again, internal... that's a good concept. It would be interesting to see – that played out that's sort of, that's sort of like there, there's something to that that fits in with what we were just talking about but then sam basically engineers a bloody battle yeah, <laughs> so he yeah. can escape. And, and granted this is always going to be the problem with any adaptation of lord of the rings how do the orcs not recognize frodo and sam are not orcs okay all right setting that aside because that's something that every adaptation has to deal with in their own way especially yeah. if you're portraying it visually as opposed to say an audio adaptation fine besides the fact that we've got to you know that the orc helmets apparently have orc wigs attached to them. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Great tufts. You basically have you have you have notably notably uh, uh, different different color skinned Sam and Frodo walking along, and Sam basically urging the orc captain, "Oh, you're going to stand for that, sir?" Yeah. And all that, stirring them all up, and it's sort of like you know, cut them to bits. And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah thank you, noble Sam." <laughs> yeah. like you going to stand for that, sir? Mm-hmm. Get back in line. You mean you're going to let a pack of filthy man creatures go before us? Uh, well, uh... and you call yourself an orc? You're right. Right. Kill them. Own them. Cut up to bits. But the other, the other silly moment. And this is one of those ones that, again, when I was first encountering the story and then I read the book and realized, oh, it's a little different, is this. Okay, the ring is destroyed. Fine. Everything kind of goes fine and things like that. Da-da-da-da-da-da. Um, everything's falling apart. Everything's things like this. In the Jackson film essentially is the same thing. The towers, the T's collapse, all the rest of it. But then the army gets saved by the eagles. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Like, when we say this, the eagles obviously show up in the book, and obviously Frodo and Sam are rescued from Mount Doom with Gandalf coming along to do that. That is an element. But in this film, we have the idea that an entire army of eagles comes and takes the entire army of Aragorn and Just Rohan and everybody. Picks them all up one Just by one. Thousands. <laughs> and flies of them pe- away. Thousands <laughs> yes. of people. Wow. Just baffling. Wow. Yeah. And, like, you don't. 
That's another one where it's just a totally unforced error. Mm-hmm. You do, you did not have to do that. Yeah. Like all you have, you've, you've, there are so many, uh, I've never said this word out loud before. Lacunae? Lac- L- lacunae, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there are so many lacunae in, in this adaptation. So why not? Just let the art just like, imply that they fought the remnants of the armies of Mordor or something. Yeah. Like you don't, yeah, you don't need the the logistics of like yeah. six thousand <laughs> eagles or whatever it has to be for this. It raises way more questions than it answers. Yeah. It really does. <laughs> uh, I'm keeping an eye on the time and making sure that we don't go too crazy here. Partially because again, I have to do this as a really quick edit over the next few days due to other plans. <laughs> yeah. And the longer it gets, the more we'll be like, ah. So there are a couple of things that I want to bring up uh, as we did at the end of the Rankin Bass Hobbit and we sort of mentioned along the way, let's give a little more credit to Topcraft and the crew um, mm-hmm. who were working with what they had to do the yeah. best they could. And uh, and uh, as Oriana pointed out uh, in the Hobbit episode, uh, Topcraft do an amazing job of basically the idea of Middle Earth uh, interpreted through watercolor with all the mm-hmm. background designs. It's so um, beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's really well done. I can't knock them any of all. The adaptations of the maps are all really nicely done, too. Um, but, yeah, just the way that the mountains are showing the forests, um, the general setup, Jared mentioned uh, Minas Tirith uh, looks really, really good. I mean, that really helped when I was mm. a kid getting a sense of, oh, this is what it can look like, you know, yeah. and uh, that's yeah. really good, too. I still think the Sirith Ungol interpretation holds up. It's actually more accurate to the book than in the Jackson version, where it stands out more on a promontory in that version, whereas here it's more meant to be sort of like the three layers up against a up, up against things. Like so a split-level house, kind of. Yeah, mm. yeah. And uh, all that. Uh, Tower of Teeth are good. The Barad-dûr is interesting. I didn't buy that. I, mm, uh, yeah. Mm. It just looks like a fairy tale castle. It's like evil sleeping beauty, and I don't think that that's the right choice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's like a cousin of, I can't pronounce it, the famous one in, in south of Germany, uh, Bavaria Neuschwanstein or whatever it is. Neuschwanstein. Yeah, yeah. So that it's sort of like an l- elaborate version of that with taller towers and things yeah. like that. So it had that same sort of, yeah, fairy tale esque approach. It's sort of like, this is, you know, in retrospect, it's like, this is not really where Sauron draw. Now, what about Sauron's interpretation himself of the flaming eye? I liked that. That was yeah. interesting. I did like that. Yeah. It I, was... I liked the that it was abstract enough to be mm-hmm. just kind of ominous and like, oh, I get that it's an eye. It's kind of freaky. It's kind of, it's interrupting the visuals in a really, like, in a really cool way. Like, it, it kind of it's oppressive in the way it just like bursts in and is like, ah, oh, flames or whatever. And I like it a lot more than the version of Sauron in the Jackson movies, which is, for, to me, is a cool visual for one shot. Mm-hmm. Like the first time you see it, it's like, oh my god, it's the eye. But then it's diminishing returns and it gets more and more cartoony, especially when it starts like making expressions at yeah. the top of the tower. But yeah. having this just be like this orb, this flaming orb that is the eye of Sauron was such a cool abstract way of conveying his presence without mm-hmm. having to actually show the <laughs> the eye. Yeah. And I also like there's a there's there's also like the fact that uh you know in as much as he's shown as being anywhere, he's not actually shown as being in Barador. It's more yeah. like this thing sort of floating behind Barador, which is weird on the one hand, but on the other hand, kinda works. It is the sort yeah. of spectral presence. So yeah, it is, uh, I would say it's needlessly confusing, but it mm. is a lot better than having him just show up and be some guy with a big red eye or something like that. (laughs) (laughs) Which I was afraid was going to happen. I was so sure that they were going to see him and he was just going to be like some guy in black armor. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like the Nazgul, but maybe taller or with an even shriekier voice. I don't know. Well, like an evil version of Billy Crystal's character from Monsters, Inc. with a one eye. <laughs> <Yeah. that> <laughs> you know, things like that. So, uh, but there it is. Yeah. It, and Oh, the ending, we at least have to look, let's, mm. let's wrap up with the ending. Cause yes. the ending is really bizarre. We get the gray havens, not too bad and things like this. It's the lead up to it. That is the part that basically has you banging your head against the wall um, because you get, you get the idea that, okay, revelation that everyone's going, the uh, Elrond's going to go off to the West to get moisturized. Cause he really looks like he needs it at this point. <laughs> oh, he's so <laughs> tragic looking. <laughs> and, uh, and then, so the idea is that sort of, you could almost argue that the farewell scene in the book, the proper sense of farewells is uh, happens here in Rivendell. Uh, okay, fine. Even though the characters, you know, whatever, hmm. but we, get this bizarre exchange (laughs) after after the division that that Frodo will go that Sam has to stay and all that we get Frodo's little indication about you know plump hobbit wives (laughs) just like that just a big case of the not gays (laughs) I love my curvy hobbit wife 
<laughs> and uh, and you know, good Hobbit meals. At least at least their wives are ranked above the meals, you know. But, right. but then the meals came first, and then the kids. It was like yeah. wife meals kids. There's, That's there's Hobbit hierarchy for you. Mm. The wife has to come first to use somebody to cook for you and bear your curvy Hobbit children or whatever. <laughs> And then we get this whole bit where all of a sudden Gandalf starts riffing on the idea that mysteriously hobbits are, in fact, going to be uh. much like men are and are evolving and growing taller even as we speak. You get this bizarre thing about, oh, Frodo is already taller than Bilbo. Sam is taller than than, than Frodo. And Merry and Pippin are taller still. Uh, no ants no in this thing. No, <laughs> thank <it's just> you. <laughs> really, really bizarre. And then it gets to this whole thing where you know, Gandalf goes like, you know, and future people may wonder, is there hobbit in me? And then we get a fourth wall break, a fourth wall break to the camera where, where he looks at the audience and says, you know, is there Hobbit in me? I go, is there on me? Look to the camera. Is there? And he almost winks, I think, or something like that. Huh? What troubles you, Sam? Will there be no room for hobbits in this new age of man? I think so. For us all, hobbits are the closest to men, the most human. And one day they will be as men are. Look you, Frodo is a bit larger than Bilbo, just as you are larger than Frodo. And younger still than you and larger are Merry and Pippin. And if you keep the Book of the Hobbits as Frodo asked, ages from now, when your stories are still told, there will be those humans who might well wonder, is there Hobbit in me? Is there? This is, of course, this is how this Hobbit, this Road Turn of the King adaptation would end. <laughs> God, I hated that. <laughs> Profoundly incorrect. It's just, just so it's missing the point so much of yeah. the like the magic going away vibe of the ending. It's like actually right. hobbits didn't go away. They walk among you now. Little, <laughs> it feels infantilizing almost. A like oh like yeah. this is for babies. Oh, what if you're like kind of like a hobbit? It's like <laughs> Dang. it's just <laughs> Yeah. It it does feel as though this is like they they forgot to update their mindset in terms of like who is this for and they were like yeah like it's still for babies it feels kind of still for for babies babies. yeah yeah at least the bakshi one was like not for babies no definitely (laughs) clearly not and this one was like (laughs) fun for the whole family (laughs) yeah yeah Hmm. boy well excuse me i think we vented enough (laughs) well what's funny like there's not that much venting to do because it's so Mm. insubstantial overall true true there's not much to dig into we can nitpick a lot and talk about all the things that are like just don't work not like the book or whatever but Mm -hmm. yeah or that don't work but but overall it was like there's so much less here to really get into than there was in like the freaking silver call duology Mm-hmm. Like, oh, like that was a nightmare, but there was a lot that was really instructive about it. Right. Yeah. Yes. And yes. This is not that. This is just sort of it's it. It doesn't succeed well enough where it does succeed to actually make you care about the choices made elsewhere. It's more yeah. sort of like here's this mound of rotting blah, and here's there's a flower growing out of it, but that's about it. You and know? it's not even a really cool mm-hmm. flower, you know. It's yeah, like, yeah. It just it's sort a of, dandelion. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's like thanks. So it 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 has no legacy unless you count that song. <laughs> it is just there. It is a weird weird thing. It uh, it pretty much ended that cycle of adapting in the English language, trying to do it animated style. There's been nothing else like it since that I can think of until we get next year. We do get the actual yeah. anime version uh, with the War of the Rohirrim. So in a weird way, we are returning back to Japanese animation, only this time much more consciously and much more in the vein that it's an actual Japanese creator working it down the line, if off a of script, of course, being developed by uh, Philippa Boyens and her kid and however that's being worked out. But the point is, we'll be getting a, a new adaptation in animation form of uh, of of, uh, Tolkien here coming up soon enough and uh, let's see what's changed. I think a lot will yeah. have changed for the better. Here's hoping. We don't know how the story will land, of course. You know, that'll be its own issue. We'll cross our fingers on that one. But uh, until then, uh, thank you Rankin and Bass. You you existed and you did this and uh, that's all I really have to say. <laughs> I think we'll wrap up on that one. All right.
right. The choice of episode topics has come around to Oriana. And sure, we've already given it away a bit on social media, but hey, let's make the announcement here. Oriana, what are we talking about next time? For our very special live episode, we have to do a very special topic, which is the (laughs) much-blighted Peter Jackson Hobbit trilogy. (laughs) Big Hans Zimmer, like... (laughs) We're we're gonna we're gonna do all three so we don't have to think about them again. <laughs> all three of them, the three the theatrical version, watch them, don't watch them, uh probably don't watch yeah, them. Yeah, you don't have to watch to, them. We're, to we're gonna along. take one for you guys. Yeah, here. <laughs> we will uh, you know, I want we want this God. episode to be as accessible to everyone as possible. Uh so get ready for that. With the Rankin Bass one, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this. You know, with the, the, the problem with, with the Return of the King is sort of like, okay, we knew on instinctively on the level of what we would get thanks to the Hobbit is sort of like, okay, the Rankin is like, okay, there it is. This, this, this is his own kettle of fish, and we'll have much more to say. Yeah, you know, <laughs> this is like an eight-hour commitment. Uh, this is, you know, like my husband and I rewatched Band of Brothers recently, and it's like probably around the same time commitment. <laughs> <laughs> Make your way through it. You got a few weeks. You can do it. We got it. <laughs> We're in your corner. Yeah, I'm gonna have nope. to. I'm just gonna have to dig these up myself and <laughs> do that. So, oh, oh, oh boy. But uh, but it it will be. We've been threatening to talk about this for a while. We keep making references. Almost not quite every other episode, but every week comes up. We're like, oh boy. <laughs> so we're gonna we're we'll do our best to engage with it full on. And uh, Oriana will lead the way because she has things to say. Rightly so. <laughs> Rightly so. So that'll be good. So um, until next time, in the next next time you will hear us, it will be, hey, that live recording. So let's go over it again just real briefly. If you are able to make it to Portland, Oregon, Saturday, April 22nd, it starts at 5 p.m. Um, our co-podcasts uh, on the network, It's Just a Show and Game Show 1939, will start it off. We will be headlining the evening, more or less. Um, again, the place to look for more information, including any further updated stuff, is megaphonic.fm slash Live dash twenty twenty three two zero two three, and that's where any further information as need be will be posted. Um, if you haven't yet talked to us one way or another, whether online or elsewhere, through the website, through Discord, or whatever, and you happen to show up there and want to say hi, please say hi. You know, we'd be we'd love to chat with you. We uh, certainly uh, uh, hope that uh, we hope we see some new to us faces there because um, that would be great. And uh, again, we'll see if maybe there are other ways to make it uh, other things available down the line. But either way, it will be our next episode. You will hear it in early May. Um, but uh, that'll happen as it does. You'll hear this in the meantime, and you have plenty of time to get ready. So thank you again for listening. We absolutely appreciate it. We we can't believe we've come this far, but we're very glad we've come this far. And we look forward to our 50th episode and more beyond with that. Um, thank you for joining us, as always. Uh, episodes, uh, notes, and things like this included, as always, in our usual post. Ways to contact us through our webpage, megaphonic.fm slash by the Bible water um, and how to contact us on social media and elsewhere is there too until next time we hope to see you in a month's time and we hope to hear from you after you hear us in a month's time if you weren't able to make it either way until then <laughs>